You've made it through to the last session of the day, so thank you and congratulations for that. I hope your energy levels are sufficient enough uh, for you to stick with us for the next half an hour or so. Um, but I do believe this will be a, an interesting and, dare I say, it, educational session as well. Um, briefly, my name is Ryan Shields. I'm the Director of Communications, um, as Melissa indicated, at the Victorian Council of Social Service. Um, to my left in our guest for this afternoon is Ryan Batchelor, MP. Uh, he's the member for, tell me if I get this right or wrong, All Southern right. Metro. That's correct. Uh, which is Melbourne's sort of southeast and eastern suburbs. Yeah, inner, inner east, inner south, bayside suburbs. Fantastic. He has a, a long and distinguished CV, which I won't read out in full. Um, I put, won't put you through that misery, um, but is obviously a, a state MP elected in 2022, um, but has served as the, the head of Julia Gillard's policy unit in the federal government sphere um, and as a senior advisor in the federal and state governments before crossing the fence um, and becoming an MP himself. Uh, you, you could have got all that from his website, of course, what his website wouldn't say, and Ryan won't, but I maybe can, um, that he's also a, a rising star of the Victorian Parliament on the Labor side of politics. So we're, we're very lucky to have him here today. If you could please welcome Ryan Batchelor. So welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, so our topic for discussion today is advocacy and what makes good advocacy. It's a, a very big and broad question, which we can probably jump into 10 different ways. But I might just start with that, with your background and experience yeah. as the topic. What makes good advocacy to government? I think at a really basic level, being really clear about what it is that you want is the key to good advocacy. It might sound, um, might sound pretty simple or trite, but it's amazing how many times people will come through the door, uh, uh, whether in my time as a ministerial advisor in Canberra, chief of staff, um, and I spent also spent some time as public servant here in Victoria before going into the pub. So I've seen things from a lot of angles. Um, the most successful advocates are people who come in knowing what they want and having uh, an idea about how they can work with you, either as a politician or an advisor or a bureaucrat to get that outcome. Um, and in my experience, those are the people who've got a clear sense of what they're trying to get to are the most effective at what they're trying to when the, the, getting there. Because we spend a lot of time dancing around problem identification, um, which is important, but I guess you can get bogged down in. So it's about taking it to that next level. I think that's right. I think it is really important to educate politicians about uh, the nature of problems. Um, one of the things that being in politics as a politician, like I've worked in and around politics for a long time now. I, was, I don't even want to say how long it's been, more than 20 years, um, that there's so much going on all the time. Uh, and as a politician, you've got to be across everything that's happening in your communities. Um, uh, ministers, their large portfolios, generally they've got multiple portfolios. Um, so there is, um, there is a lot confronting us. I think one of the really important things when you're going and, and talking is that you just can't assume that the uh, politician you're talking to has got as much knowledge about all this as you do. Um, so you do have to do a bit of education. You've got to do a bit of problem definition. Um, and telling that those problems in a way that is um, that, that uses all those sort of narrative storytelling techniques that's got some good data backing it up but also doesn't just stop at that. That um, I think good advocacy has to uh, bring the politician right into the centre of what it is that you're talking about, make them understand at a very personal level um, and at a system level um, what it is that uh, you see the problem as being and then move that to, the, to where the solutions take you. Um, now, we do only have a short time this afternoon, but I want it to be chock full of all your questions. Um, so Ryan and I will keep speaking for another couple of minutes, uh, but the roving mics are in the room. So please do put your hand up and grab the attention of the VCOS and Daru staff members, and we'll get to those questions as, as soon as we've got some uh, ready to go. Um, in terms of who to advocate to, uh, again, sometimes I think you know, we feel and advocates feel you need to go to the responsible minister or the premier or the prime minister, whoever it may be. Um, what, what are the other options? You're currently a, a backbench MP. Um, what, what are the other options to get to a parliamentarian? Yeah, I think um, local connections to local members of parliament are really important. And 
you shouldn't underestimate um, how quick and effective it can be is if you've got a good relationship with the local member of parliament in your community um, and present a compelling case to them, often they can access a minister pretty quickly, um, uh, whether it's just walking in the halls of the parliament, we get called in and out of divisions in the, in the legislative chamber all the time. Um, incidental conversations are often some of the easiest to have. Um, and if you've had a meeting with your MP, um, you've got a particular uh, concern about a service provider in a local community or whether it's a, one of their constituents who is um, uh, experiencing a problem that clearly is happening to a whole lot of other people, making sure they're aware of it um, and asking them to raise it. Um, often um, uh, people are a little bit shy sometimes, you'd hard to believe, but sometimes particularly individuals um, can be a little bit shy about saying, well, can you raise my issue with, um, with, with Minister X or Minister Y? Um, doesn't always result in um, positive outcomes, but it is a really effective way of, of connecting with your local member of parliament, getting them to then go and be an advocate on your behalf really good way to do it. Bringing them out into their community as well, having something to show them at a local level, really important. And what do you mean by that, show them at a local level? Can you, can you give me some examples of where you've seen that done well? Yeah, I think um, politicians get, uh, you know, we could, people, we could fill our diaries with people coming into the office and wanting to talk to us about, about issues. Um, what I think, certainly I like and what others, my colleagues like, is actually going and visiting a service provider, seeing something actually happening in action, talking at a, ca at a casual and informal level to um, uh, whether it's people with disability, whether it's their family, whether it's their carers, whether it's service providers, understanding that at a really um, simple and effective level. Um, making that connection. I think one of the things that um, we did a lot back when I was working uh, in federal politics, uh, while I was working for Julia, um, was in that sort of period where we were trying to get the NDIS up and running. Um, we we're trying to get uh, commitments to it. Um, obviously, we're in a different space now. I'm not across as what's happened in the last 10 years or so since I left, um, le left, left federal politics. But um, one of the great experiences we had was we had a meeting, big community meeting out in a school somewhere in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. I can't remember where it was. But one of the things that we had there were representatives of the local deaf blind group who came and um, set up a conversation um, between uh, members of the deaf blind community uh, and the prime minister and, and the ministers um, who got to experience at a very first hand way what that communication was like for them and, and showed some of the, the first hand the barriers and it was a different setting than they were used to seeing it wasn't a, a briefing pack it wasn't um, words on a page it was authentic communication from people in their community it made a big difference yeah wonderful and, and sometimes to get to that point uh, for people on the outside of politics um, seems impenetrable yeah. you know the political system is opaque sometimes by design sometimes just because it hasn't been demystified yet. And you mentioned in passing before, you know, have a good relationship with your local MP, you know, invite them to a, something in the community. But how do you make that first connection? I think this is something advocates and, and aspiring advocates sometimes struggle with. Persistence. Um, I'm sure I don't need to tell people in this room the importance of persistence, but it is, it is really important. Um, it's finding, whether it's, uh, writing in, emailing, um, uh, taking moments are really important and doing it, I, I think, particularly if you're trying to cold approach someone out in the community, whether they're at another event um, uh, or whether you're putting in uh, a request for a meeting, those initial requests and that initial approach um, has got to be as, really as, as friendly as you can possibly make it. You don't want to go from zero to a hundred in terms of the um, uh, intensity of the uh, information you're presenting straight away. Um, you do need to build that up, I think, um, uh, in the in the process. Um, uh, so I think that's that, that's the first step. But when you get 
there and get in the room, um, then I think you've got to be really clear about what it is that you're there for um, and to make sure that um, you're walking out the door having been really clear um, with the politician about exactly why this matters to them and what it is that you're seeking them to do. Um, and, and often you'll know this better than me, but you don't get long in a, in a constituent or political meeting like that, so every minute must count. Yeah, and I think the more, um, you know, the more important um, the person, uh, the less time you obviously get, and that's a kind of um, standard rule. I mean, someone like me, you could probably sit, we could talk for an hour or so about uh, disability policy, like I'd be, put me in my happy place, but... Um, so you're here till about eight, is yeah, that right? That's yeah. right. <laughs> okay. um, uh, but particularly if, you, if you've got, you know, you're trying to get in to see a minister, um, you're trying to get in to see a leader of the government, whether that's a premier or a treasurer or, you know, senior people, um, you've really got to, um, you've really got to be sharp in your advocacy. You've really got to have a clear sense of what it is you're trying to do and get there. A good friend of mine um, uh, 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 from my time in Canberra gives this, it's not my, um, not my advice, but uh, hers, is that she likes to do a kind of, um, pre-brief meeting outcomes note to the staff um, when she goes in and says, here's what we're going to come to you with and here's, um, here's what uh, I'm writing down what I'm trying to get out of this conversation before we get in the door. Hang on, this is an advocate writing yeah. a note to the principal staff to say here's what we want out of the meeting. Correct. Right. It's kind of like a pre-brief um, and a, a plan for the meeting so that they've got a good sense of where it is that you're trying to go. Obviously, you do that once you've got the meeting secured. Um, obviously, and you know, you can always stray a little bit from what's written down. Um, but that is a good uh, process that she advocates people do so that they're really clear in their mind so that they don't get, A, distracted. Politicians are very good at distracting people um, who come to meet them uh, on, you know, we could take them off on little journeys about um, talking, you know, little meanders through through the through the meadow in terms of have you stories. seen the view out of my 14 story <laughs> yeah, window that's, that's a right big one. that's right do you know what they're doing all of those things there are there are there are myriad ways to um distract in a meeting and if you've if you've done the hard work to get in there you want to be really clear about what it is that you can get out of it and and having a plan going in worth weight and gold uh now do we have any questions from the audience i haven't seen anyone waving at me oh we have actually one down here in the middle thank you emma um, I'll get you, of course, just to state your name and where you're from, um, and then jump straight into your question. Thank you. Heather Ryan from the Youth Disability Advocacy Service. Hey, hey. Um, so we provide uh, part of our service is individual advocacy, human rights based, based on the Victorian Charter of Human Rights. Um, but we do that statewide. Uh, there's where it, uh, the advocacy team for disabled young people, young Victorians for the whole state. <laughs> and uh, two of us are part time. <laughs> we can't go local uh, because that would, we don't, we don't have the capacity to build relationships with local uh, parliamentarians uh, on behalf of our, our young people that we advocate for. Um, my question is sometimes we need to raise things very urgently yep. and we don't have time uh, and that's because of the safety of, of the child or young person concerned um, and the usual systems haven't worked. Uh, and what, do you, sorry, what do you mean by the usual systems? The, the usual uh, options to raise. Uh, I'll give you a really common example yeah. that we see, a young person who's in out-of-home care, care in child protection at the intercept, who's also an NDIS participant, and uh, both the federal and the state government systems are both waiting on each other to see what the other one funds before they cup up their funding, right? So, uh, and in the meantime, uh, it, where it's a matter of weeks away until this young person turns 18 when child protection uh, at 11.59 p.m. before their 18th birthday, they're out. Um, we, have a whole, we have a lot of difficulty sometimes just trying to get the state government and the federal government and to get someone to talk to, to go, hey, we know that everyone's on the same page here. Everyone actually wants the same thing. 
Um, but we just need some action instead of a whole bunch of people talking around in fortnightly me in me meeting in fortnightly meetings, <laughs> discussing what needs to happen without anything actually happening. Um, we we do really well in succeeding outcome in achieving outcomes for these young people. But uh, what I'm really keen is uh, how can we, I suppose, activate some kind of public service or uh, government uh, response to uh, speak to their friends in the Canberra branch <laughs> and get something actually happening. I think here we're at the intersection between where systems work and how or don't work, um, but also about what are the policy settings that should be existing at a systems level? What are the policy solutions for these types of cases and individual cases for individual case work? And um, the way I would think about it is this happens to me regularly when people come into my office and their constituents of mine and say, I've got this particular problem with X, Y, or Z. Um, it's so frustrating that these people don't talk to these people. How do we, how do we help, how do we help solve it? Um, this, the, the usual systems should have mechanisms that are now, that allow the casework issues to be dealt with because it, we can, as, we can, as members of parliament, pick up the phone and, and, and ring. Um, it's less effective on an individual level than you would like it to be. We are not particularly powerful when it comes to individual cases. It is much more effective for us to advocate policy-based issues, right? Um, simply because uh, particularly, I spent a lot of time working uh, federally in sort of social security, child support type policy as well, where, um, you know, we would get some, we would have, there, there was always mechanisms to, um, to uh, alert on crisis issues, but um, they were pretty few and far between. Um, the system's got to have an outlet valve for the types of individual advocacy you're talking about. Um, I think uh, what we need more broadly, though, is making sure that those individual cases, and I know you two, you know, three staff, two part time, um, is not losing what they're telling us, what, what those signals are telling us about the state of the system, and then figuring out with your members, when you're doing your broader advocacy piece, what the we're um, not funded to do broader advocacy pieces. Well, the... Sorry. <laughs> well, the system, like, that's why you're here, right? These are the people, this, it's not just you, it's all of us together have responsibilities to advocate, to improve the system as a whole. And that's what we're here to do. That's what you're here to do, and that's what we're going to try and do. Uh, and, and I will say also, I've got a question in the middle over here. Um, and while we're getting there, um, work through your peak body. I know you know this, and I come from peak body land, so uh, you would expect me to say nothing less, but work through your peak bodies where you can, um, because they can also assist you with those broader advocacy pieces. It's a large part of our role and what we do. Yes, please. Um, hi, I'm Naomi Bellingham. I'm a policy, legal policy advisor with the Federation of Community Legal Centres. So peak body is great. Um, so yeah, we're the peak body for the 50 community legal centres around Victoria. Um, and I've just got a couple of questions. So um, we'll just make them quick because we have seven minutes left on the clock for this <laughs> session. <laughs> I can speak really quickly. So um, what can so if, if we get in to talk to the local minister um, and we've got these specific asks, what as in specific like policy recommendations that we want to see enacted what can we ask that uh, you know backbencher or um local mp to do other than chat to the relevant minister that's the first question and then secondly how can we hold those mps to account um and check in that they've done what they said they're going to do um in government we are constantly running sort of uh whether it's an annual cycle uh, annual budget cycle um uh, budgets don't 
um, and the annual budget process isn't just about getting funding for things. It's also about a it's also an avenue into a policy based conversation. Um, so that happens every that happens every year. So uh, uh, don't uh, I think a lot of people think that budget conversations are just about um, money and money is important for everything, but it does also open the door to a policy based discussion as well. So we do that. But you know, as a as a as a as a as a government caucus, as backbenchers, um, we engage with our parliamentary committees often. So there's ways, often ways that we can bring up issues in that parliamentary committee work. I sit on too many parliamentary committees um, and inquiries that, to mention at the moment, but that's a good way. But also, we run our inter we have internal policy conversations. We've got uh, both um, uh, uh, policy development processes that occur um, uh, where we can. Um, submit, uh, good, you know, workshop good ideas for policy reform with with ministers, with through parliamentary secretaries with ministers. So there are those mechanisms that are, that that occur all the time. But it does require people to have a an idea about what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, uh, and I imagine, and then we'll go to the next and perhaps yeah. the last question, it's useful if lots of different parliamentarians, backbenchers are hearing similar things. If Correct. you're all coming to that caucus meeting Correct. saying, I heard this, I heard something That's similar, right. That's it's right. going to carry more weight. We talk about, and we talk about those type of things regularly. Um, I think there was a hand down here in the front, please. Uh, Julianne is racing from the back of the room. <laughs> Thank you, Julianne. Hi, I'm Julie from Women with Dis Disabilities Victoria. My question is, what is the government doing to support people with disability disabilities to get into politics? Great question. I don't know is the short answer. Um, there are a range of programs that exist um, that have been really successful, particularly focused on women, getting more women into politics, um, Victorian Parliament, uh, is now gender equal for the first time ever, um, which is pretty phenomenal um, when you think about all the challenges that are still ahead of us. But I don't know if it, there are any particular, it, whether those programs have a particular focus on women with disability or whether there's any particular programs for people with disability to get into politics. Good question, I'll follow it up. And part of the context for that question we heard this morning, I'm not going to try and remember the exact figure because I'll get it wrong, um, but about the, the very small number of uh, existing parliamentarians in Australian Parliament. Oh, you're holding up four fingers. There we go. Thank you. It's, it's um, depressing. You can all do that on one hand. Um, I'm sorry? Sorry, people, people not percent. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a disappointingly yeah. and concerningly low figure. So definitely room for work and improvement there. Um, we might have time for one more question. I, you know, I've wrapped us up prematurely now. Uh, and if we don't, um, I might just ask, because uh, we've been talking a lot about, you know, what we might call inside track, direct government yep. advocacy. Um, there's a massive stream we've hardly scratched the surface of, of public facing advocacy. Yep. Um, I wanna know really how effective that is and when it is effective. Um, we love an open letter in this sector. We love a coordinated social media tile campaign, all those things. Do they make a difference in a political office? They can absolutely grab people's attention. Like, you know, it's like a, um, they're like seismographs a little bit. Um, that when you see a spike in something, you clearly know that there's an issue going on in the community because um, uh, particularly the, you know, the, the chain email, um, the social media, you know, the consistent social media, um, uh, you do you do notice it. It absolutely does. Um, it should never be all that you do, um, because as I got, what was my first point? Is you've got to come with the the ask and the outcome. Um, uh, raising awareness is important, um, uh, and whether that's through that kind of a track or whether you do things publicly, um, use the media, they are absolutely tools that should be in your toolkit, um, as should. Uh, working on relationships, uh, building trust so that you can engage. That is a hard thing to do, but building trust um, so that you can advocate directly. And so both of those things can happen at, at the same time. That's how you get, 
That's how you get to, to, I think, to successful advocacy. You can't just rely on the inside track and you can't just rely on the outside track. You've actually got to be doing both and using them effectively, you know, back and forth time to time. Yep. Everything, everywhere, all at once, if I can uh, steal that movie mm. title. Not, not, not always. I, not think, I think sometimes if things are going well, like you've got to modulate accordingly. Like if you are trying to get attention, then you might want to be doing more attention getting things. If you're gaining traction, you might be wanting to be dialing back the attention grabbing and investing more in the uh, development uh, detailed work um, because you don't want uh, something attention grabbing to distract from the good work that you're the progress that you're making. So you've got to be you've got to be thoughtful about that. Fantastic. Uh, can you please join me in thanking Ryan Batchelor? <laughs>